Welcome to the Indianola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. This morning, I, I want to continue our series on the Holy Spirit. I hope you're all right with that. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we talked about how the Holy Spirit is given, it's deposited into us when we accept Christ as our Savior. How many know that when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit? How many know that you couldn't get saved if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit? He's there, he's present, he's a part of that. And he's deposited into us when we accept Christ as our Savior. But then there's, there's more, and we talked about that last week especially. We believe that there is an experience that's distinct from and subsequent to the experience of salvation. That's what we believe. And it's a belief that, that does distinguish us from many other evangelical churches. Amen. This subsequent experience is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and it takes us from having the Holy Spirit, of us having the Holy Spirit, to a place where the Holy Spirit really has us. It, it, it's, it's more. How many can say, I want more? <laughs> I mean, if God's got more, I want it, right? Amen. And God's limitless in what he has for us. So last week, you may remember that we went over Acts 2, 1 through 4, and we saw how when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they heard a sound like a mighty rushing wind. They saw individualized flames that appeared to rest on each one as they received the Holy Spirit. Then they were all filled. And Acts 2, 4, we'll just read it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And I talked to you about the Greek word uh, glo gloss glossolalia. Everybody say glossolalia. That's not an easy one to say. Glossolalia, which is defined as speaking words that are unlearned by conventional means. The word speak is from the Greek word laleo, and the word tongues here is from the Greek word glossa. Put them together and you have glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. Now understand, that freaks some people out. How in the world does someone speak in a language that they have never learned? It's a great question, and it really deserves a great answer, and the answer is this. We serve a supernatural God who does supernatural things. It's just that simple. It's that simple. And I want to take it a bit further this morning. How do we know when a, when a believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit? How do we know? And the only way to know the answer is, is to look at Scripture. We just read what happened the first time that believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit what physical signs did they experience as, as evidence that something had happened? We, and we just read it last week, and I, I talked about it again. Uh, they heard wind, a mighty rushing wind. They saw individualized flames of fire, or cloven tongues, the Bible says, of fire, individual flames coming to rest on each one of the 120 or so that were in the upper room. And then they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Could these be the same signs that we would see today? Possibly, but let's look further. The next time in Scripture, when we see that people saw some physical sign when believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit, is in Acts chapter 8. Let's go there, Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 19. It says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And I want to take a break there, give you a little bit of background. So what was going on with, in Jerusalem was, was right after the 120 received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues, they went outside of the upper room. They left the upper room. And when people heard them, now understand, it doesn't say that they saw flames of fire over their head. It doesn't say that the people outside the upper room heard sounds like a mighty rushing wind. It says they heard them speaking in unknown tongues and it was perplexing to them. They, they didn't get it. Some of them said, these guys are drunk. And Peter said, this isn't, this isn't drunkenness, it's only nine in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied. 
that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit. And so we entered into the church age, the last days. And folks, I believe, and we'll get into this a little bit today, but, but I believe we're in the last of the last days. But in the last days, the spirit would be poured out. And so Peter then began to, he, he, he began to keep speaking and he ended up preaching a message. This is the same Peter that basically just, what, 53 days before this was denying Christ. Now he's, no, that's not good that he denied Christ. Don't say amen to that. We don't want to amen that one. That's an oh me. But he denied Christ, right? He denied Christ three times. And now with the power of the Spirit, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's speaking, he's preaching a message that he did not prepare. Let's hear the amen on that one. Amen. He's preaching a message he did not prepare and 3,000 people get saved. That's awesome. What a difference in Peter. What a total difference in him. So Peter preached and people got saved and the, the disciples and, and the, those that got saved, the church was born that day. And, and, then, and then you had uh, 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 the first martyr recorded for, the, for, for Jesus Christ. And his name was Stephen. So they're trying to, the Pharisees are trying to get a handle on all this because these, uh, these born again, saved believers in Christ, followers of Jesus, are starting to cause a ruckus in Jerusalem. And so persecution starts. Stephen is persecuted to the point of death, and then the church began to scatter. Let me say something about that this morning. When the church is persecuted, when blood starts being shed over the name of Jesus or because of the name of Jesus and the church is being killed for the name of Jesus, guess what? The church spreads, it grows. The church has always been watered by the blood of the saints. It always has been. That's a hard concept to, to hold on to. It's, it's really a hard thing to, to, uh, to uh, imagine that it takes blood to water uh, the church, but, but it's true, it always works that way. Persecution causes the church to grow. And so this persecution happened and the, the, the believers began to spread and Philip went down to Samaria and uh, began to preach the word of God there because these guys had seen all sorts of stuff. They had saw, they saw what God was doing, how he was pouring out his spirit. The church had been started. And Philip, as I said, went down to Samaria. Now we're gonna pick up where, the, where, where we're at in scripture here. Does that give you enough background? When they arrived, this is the, or when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, which was preached by Philip, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon the sorcerer saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit as well. It doesn't give us any specific physical sign here, but the scripture does tell us a lot. And I wanna just talk about that a minute. First of all, it says that these Samaritans had accepted the word of God. Everybody say accept. When you accept the word of God, that means that they heard the gospel and got saved. We also know this because it says that these new believers had been baptized in water into the name of Jesus. That's a public confession of their faith in Christ. Then we see that Peter and John felt the need, or the, the apostles in Jerusalem felt the need upon hearing about these new believers who were accepting the word and being baptized into the name of Jesus. They're saved. They felt the need that Peter and John need to go on there and pray for them, to pray for these Samaritans. Samaritans were outcast Jews because they were half Jew and half Gentile, basically. But Peter and John, although they had received Christ and they had un undoubtedly received, I'm talking about the believers, 
they'd undoubtedly received the deposit of the Holy Spirit within them, now were compelled to place their hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So again, we see the same thing. Je back, remember, 50 days before, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. That's the day the Holy Spirit was deposited into them, just like it is for us when we get saved. But then there's something more. And this just shows it again. We see that this guy, Simon, the sorcerer, saw that the Spirit was, was being given to the believers as Peter and John laid their hands on them. What did he see? These are all great questions to ask when you're reading Scripture. Well, if we're, if we're going to look at this hermeneutically, which is letting Scripture interpret Scripture, then we would go back to the last account of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and look at the physical evidence that was displayed there. What do we see in the upper room? Mighty rushing wind, individual flames of fire, settling over each one, and we saw speaking in tongues. It could have been any one of those three that Simon the sorcerer saw. He saw that the Holy Spirit was given when the, when the apostles laid hands on those believers. What did he see? It was physical. He saw it. He saw it. What did he see? It, it, like I said, it could have been any one of those. It could have been a combination of all three. We don't know because it never tells us. But it must have been pretty pronounced because Simon the sorcerer offered money and asked if he could buy this ability to, to lay hands on believers and see them baptized in the Holy Spirit. And of course, Peter rebuked him for this. So let's go to the next time in Scripture when the Holy Spirit baptized believers and, and see if there is any evidence that could be physically observed. It happened at a Gentile's, the next time, named Cornelius' house, okay? He was a centurion of what was known as the Ita Italian band. The Bible says that he was a devout man of prayer who feared God and had a giver's heart as he was very generous to the poor. And the Bible says that he prayed continually. This was a man of prayer. Well, wh while he was praying and seeking God, he had a vision and, and, and an angel came and visited him and told him to go get a man named Peter who is lodging in Simon, a lot of Simons here, right? Simon the Tanner's house, which was about 30 miles away in the city of Joppa. The Bible says that as they approached the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray where, the, where he had had a vision from the Lord to which the Lord told him not to call and clean what God had made clean. Then as Cornelius' men called out to see if a man named Peter was staying there, Peter heard the Lord tell him, go with these three men that were looking for him. Peter goes with them without hesitation. When Peter asked where they were going and why they were going, he told, they told them uh, that Cornelius, a God-fearing man, wants to hear what you have to say to him. So Peter goes with them the next day and brings some of the brothers from Joppa with him, some of his be the believing brothers, some Christians with them. They get to Cornelius' house, and his entire household is there waiting for him. The Bible says that they were all in the presence of God waiting to hear all that the Lord wanted to tell them through Peter. You know, it's interesting when we, when we talk about these things, if you start making connections and connecting the dots, you can see that, that in the upper room they were in prayer and they were in God's presence. Here, Cornelius' house is in prayer and they're in God's presence. It's very interesting. Peter starts preaching the gospel to them, talking about Jesus and his gift on the cross and his resurrection. And Acts 10, 44 through 45 says this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So here we see again the Holy Spirit being poured out, and this time no one laid hands on them like they did down in Samaria, but those Jews that came with Peter were amazed because these Gentiles were receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they knew it because of the physical evidence they saw, which is talked about in the next verse, verse 46. And it says this, are you following with me this morning? Am I moving too quick? We're making a case here. Acts 10, 46 it says, for they heard them speaking in tongues and exalting God. So here's the physical evidence that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was happening. The Jews that were with Peter saw it and they were amazed that God was pouring out his spirit even on these Gentile believers. If you don't know what a Gentile is, it's somebody who's not a Jew. 
Up until this point, the Jews were God's chosen people. They were the ones, they even had a little bit of a uh, pride and an arrogance, maybe a lot of pride and arrogance about that. But here, God was showing them that he was willing and he was going to be pouring his spirit out even on Gentiles. Pretty awesome. How many are, are Gentiles in here today? <laughs> I'm a Gentile. And I'm still a child of God because I've been grafted into the vine. Amen? An interesting thing to note here is that Peter then called for them to be baptized in water into Jesus' name because that hadn't happened yet. They had been saved. They were following Jesus. They, 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 Cornelius was a God-fearing man. They had accepted the message that they had been hearing, but they had not yet been baptized because they weren't they weren't Jews. They, they didn't follow everything. They were just getting pieces. And now that the Holy Spirit had come upon them, it was like God was putting his stamp of approval on Gentiles being real Christians or being Christians that he could pour out his spirit upon, which then Peter said, is there any reason why we shouldn't baptize these guys? It's pretty interesting when you get looking at it, all of it and putting these pieces together. So in this scripture we just read, we see again physical evidence being displayed as believers were being baptized or immersed into the person of the Holy Spirit. And the only evidence listed here is glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. Speaking in a language that they had never learned. You know, I, I want to I take a little rabbit trail here because we, uh, we're living in a world where, where it seems like everybody's being accused of racism all the time. I, I saw this in scripture as I, was, as I was studying this this week, and I thought this is really interesting in reference to what's going on in our world. The fact that Peter and John went to Samaria and understand the Jewish uh, people of Jerusalem, they thought they were the real Jews. They considered Samaritans and, and I'm, I'm just saying what they considered. I, I don't want to be offensive to anybody. They considered them half-breeds. There was a deep hatred between the Jerusalem Jews and the Samaritan Jews because of that. In fact, the Jews from Jerusalem would avoid Samaria altogether. That's why when Jesus gave the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was so profound because Jews, they hated Samaritans. They hated them. They weren't real Jews. They were just half-breeds in their minds. And yet, isn't it interesting that right after the, the, the first time that God poured out his spirit in the upper room, the next time that's mentioned is a group of people that these people hated? I found that very interesting. Then the next time, it's people who weren't even of the Jewish people at all. It's Cornelius' house, a bunch of Gentiles. You know, God, if, if you want to serve a God who's completely uh, blind to race, there it is. Our God has made us all, and he's made us all beautiful and wonderful. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, and there's no place for racism in the house of God. There's, there's no place for that, right? Right? And we, we see that God poured out his spirit on everyone. Not to mention, let, let, me, let me take it a step further. In the upper room, the 120 all were speaking in tongues. And that included women. God is no respecter of persons. And if you're a, a man who is kind of got your chest puffed out and you're like yeah we're the superior uh, sex we're the superior gender let me tell you there are women who are who have who are so powerful in the spirit that they could uh <laughs> in a prayer showdown they'd win we'll just say it that way okay god is no respecter of persons he doesn't it, it, he poured his spirit out on everyone Everyone, And I think in those three instances that we've gone over so far, you see that so clearly. But let's look at the next account in the book of Acts where believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The apostle Paul, while on his third missionary journey, came to the city of Ephesus. 
and this is all the way to Acts chapter 19. There he met some followers of Jesus, and this is basically their conversation in Acts chapter 19, verse 2 through 5. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism, they replied. So Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Okay, so basically these believers that he found were, they were believers, they were followers of Jesus, but they'd only been baptized in John's baptism or a baptism of repentance to say, I'm sorry for my sins. And we don't baptize like John did here in water. We, we baptize in water into the name of Jesus, okay? And that's exactly what Paul did. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one that was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul found some water, and he got them fully dunked in water. Baptismal, right? That's the word. We, we learn the Greek word. It means a fully full immersion, full dunking to dip, basically. And he got them all the way under the water and baptized them into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul, this is the next verse, six through seven, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So here again, there is this physical evidence that is mentioned when the baptism of the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit takes place. Here we see the evidence as being speaking in tongues. It's it just cl clear as a bell. Or glossolalia. And prophesying, which it also mentions. Which here in the Greek is the word, uh, let's see, I gotta say, get, get boned up on my Greek here. Prophetuo, prophetuo. It means to speak forth to prophesy, to speak forth by divine inspirations, to predict. And it carries with it the idea of foretelling future events pertaining especially to the kingdom of God, to declare a thing which, which can only be known by divine revelation. That's prophesying. And so these believers, upon Paul laying his hands on them, began to speak in tongues, speak in a language they had never learned naturally speaking, and they began prophesying or declaring foretelling even things, events, especially pertaining to the kingdom of God. And they were declaring things that could only be known by divine revelation. So when you examine these four instances in scripture, it's hard to develop a theology regarding the baptism. It's not hard to, to uh, 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 develop a theology regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, um, it's there a lot. And this isn't the only Instances where we, where we hear about the baptism in the Holy Spirit or we hear about speaking in tongues. Each one of these instances tells us that the baptism into the person of the awe-inspiring spirit of the living God was accompanied by signs. There were physical evidentiary signs. And the most common one out of all four of those, initially speaking, was that they spoke in other tongues. And we also see prophesying and we see the mighty rushing wind and the individual flames of fire within, the, within that biblical evidence mentioned, but most often we see that they spoke in new tongues, unlearned languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. When I talk about water baptism sealing the deal when it comes to accepting Christ, I've mentioned that before. You know, if you've been saved, get baptized in water into the name of Jesus. It seals the deal. That public confession of your faith seals the deal. But there's also similarities when it comes to the Holy Spirit baptism. It's as if Christ seals the deal in your experience with being baptized in the Holy Spirit by giving you the evidence of tongues. Now, now this is a gift, and, and I believe it's for everyone. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is for everyone. Turn to your other neighbor and say, this is for me. I believe it's a gift that is given to everyone. It, it never says in scripture that this particular gift was withheld from anyone who desired it. It seems that in all of these instances where the baptism in the Holy Spirit occurred, everyone receiving for the first time spoke in tongues. And it's interesting that the Bible does not declare that this will cease while we are still in the church age. And friends, we're still in the church age. 
We are in that period where God's grace is available to everyone that believes upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how much longer we have. Some of the signs out there show that it could be getting very, very short before we see Jesus come back, roll back that eastern sky, and that trumpet sound uh, blares out, and, and we're all called home in the, in the rapture of the church where there'll be a, a glorious reunion in the air. I mean, that day is coming. It's coming soon where the dead in Christ will rise first. All of those that have gone on before us that knew the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to come right up out of that ground and they're going to meet the Lord in the air and then we're going to go boosh right behind them and we're going to meet them in the air. And if you think I'm talking crazy, I'm not. I'm not talking crazy. That's scripture. It's just plain, simple scripture. It's not veiled in its meaning. It's just right there in your face and that's what's going to happen. And we're going to get to see <laughs> those ones that have gone on before us. You know, I can focus on that and grief for losing some of those people here on earth doesn't overwhelm me because I know there's a day coming. The cross has the final word. You know? How many are missing someone right now? You miss that loved one. Could be a mom, a brother, a dad, a child. That day is coming. Now I'm getting off on something else. I could preach on that today. That just flat out excites me. We're in this church age and it's coming to an end. I, I, I want to I give you an illustration, a story that, that it was an experience that I had when I was a youth pastor in South Dakota. I was preaching in our youth center and we had we had uh, moved out of the church. There really wasn't space in our little church for the youth group that we had, so we, we began to rent a building downtown, and we created this youth center, and we had all sorts of cool things and uh, cool ministry that went out of there. It was awesome. It was an awesome place. We actually had, um, you, you know, one of the cool things we did is we had uh, Pastor Jared and Devin's uh, uh, bachelor and bachelorette party in that, in that building, I think, didn't we? Yeah, that was a crazy night. If you want to, if you want to know about the, how crazy that night was, take them out to to supper, and they'll tell you. But um, uh, you have to buy though, right? They have to buy. Okay, if you want the real story, you got it. I, all I know is it involved um, Pastor Jared being duct taped in forty degree weather in a pet cemetery and left all alone. So, I <laughs> and I had everything to do with that. So if you want to know, just uh, just go ahead and and take them out to eat. But I was in this youth center and preaching, and we would have kids from the community come in, and they'd be a part of the, the ministry there. And, and one night I, I preached. I was just preaching straight up salvation like I always did in this place. And we had a young gal who came in. Her name was Melanie. And Melanie came in, and she was, she was a, a part of the service. She had never, ever been to church before in her whole life. She had never really knew what church was. She was very confused by the whole thing. But she came in. She was invited by a friend. She experienced it. And then um, at the end, when I talked about accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, she accepted Christ and gave her heart to, to the Lord, which was awesome, and we were so excited for her, and we gave her the material, which was just follow-up stuff as far as your relationship with Jesus. I never once talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I never talked about speaking in tongues. No literature I gave her talked about speaking in tongues, but I got a call at 10 o'clock that night from her, and she said, what did you do to me? Because I had given her my card, and I said, what do you mean? She goes, ever since I laid down for bed, I, I, I tried praying. I started praying, like you said, and it was just talking to God, and I started talking to God, and then these weird languages came out of my mouth. And I said, well, just pray over the phone and let me hear it. And she was speaking in tongues without even knowing anything about it. So for all you that think it's just learned behavior, this was not learned behavior. It's nothing she'd ever heard or seen before. She was young. She's a sophomore. So she starts praying in tongues, and, and I just began <laughs> weeping immediately. And I'm like, girl, that, that's speaking in tongues, and that's something we didn't even talk about. She goes, well, what is it? It's freaking me out. <laughs> and we talked about it. And then I came to know in the next days and the next weeks that she lived in a home where her father was addicted and her mom her mom wasn't around but she lived in a home where her father was addicted to um 
horror films, but they weren't the kind of horror films that, that, you are, that probably you and I have, have maybe seen or seen or know of. These were ones you have to specially order because they're so gruesome, they're not even normally available, and, and he had racks of them in his house, and he was addicted to them. And can you imagine the demonic activity that was going on in that home? And God loved little Melanie so much that he baptized her in the Spirit to protect her from all that. And I thought that was so amazing. Such an awesome story of God's grace, even in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I want to say this. There are a lot of people who don't experience speaking in tongues right away. And let me tell you that it's not because God doesn't want you to have this gift or that you haven't earned it because you could never earn it, all right? Amen. We oftentimes have our own mental hurdles that keep us from experiencing this gift. Extremely analytical people often struggle. The more analytical you are, the more probably you'll struggle. Not all people who are analytical struggle with this, but many do, uh, because they can't wrap their minds around it. And honestly, and hear me, guys, that's the whole point. When we pray or extol or praise or worship God in an unknown tongue, it doesn't involve our physical brains. And I believe that's the whole purpose. When we realize that one of our biggest enemies in life is our own stinking thinking, and that our minds are literally battlefields in which the devil does some of his most horrific work, then it starts to make perfect sense. What if the Holy Spirit, the third personality of the one triune God, what if he could help us pray perfectly, get our mind out of it, and get our spirit man more involved. The, the, the only way would be to supersede our minds and let our spirit man sit in the driver's seat for a change. See, I, I, I believe this. I think it's real easy for our flesh to sit in the driver's seat, our body. This is our body, right? We're a triune being. Body, soul, spirit, right? Body, this shell that we're in. Some of you got some pretty nice shells. I won't fill in or say any more about that. <laughs> Some of you hadn't taken care of your shells very well. I might be one of those. I guess I did say more. I lied. But this is our body. Then we have our soul, which are mind, will, and emotions. That part of us that makes us us. And then we have the spirit man that we, we kind of don't really understand. We know it's the point, that is that part of our person that connects with God. And, and it's easy to have our flesh in the driver's seat, our body in the driver's seat. How many have ever, their, their body got in the driver's seat? Like, like it was in control, your flesh, what your flesh wanted. How many of, okay, nobody raised their hand. Let me ask this. Have you ever been to a buffet and went back when you shouldn't have? <laughs> your body was in the driver's seat. Your flesh was in the driver's seat, okay? And how many know our soul can be in the driver's seat and probably most often is between those two, our body or our soul, that part of us that's our mind, will, and emotions. We think about it, we're like, okay, I gotta do this, and if I do this, and I do that. And intellectual, intellectually, we try to wrap our mind around something and then we, we make decisions because God gave us this amazing organ, this, the, our brains, and it's easy to just do that. But you know, th there's this thing where we let our spirit man sit in the driver's seat and we don't do it as often as we should. But what if we let him in the driver's seat, we shut this thing down, this thing that causes us so many problems, the thing between our two ears, and we let that spirit part of us connect with the Holy Spirit and he begins to speak to our spirit, and we begin to speak out of our mouth. Amen. Languages that we never learned. That is what speaking in tongues is. Yes. We will speak in tongues as he gives us utterances. And we won't be, they won't be heard with your physical ears and then repeated out of your physical mouths. They will be heard within our spirit man way deep down within us, they actually won't be heard. They'll be felt more than heard. Yeah. And they will just sort of bubble up out of your belly and flow right out of your mouth. Yeah. 
and you will be the one talking. It's your physical tongue talking. It's not God talking for you using your mouth. It's you allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to your spirit and then letting the words flow out of your mouth simultaneously. It could come in the form of earthly language and it could make, come in the form of he, a heavenly language that no one on this planet, planet can understand. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Mysteries, things that nobody could know. I wanna pray that way. Wouldn't it be awesome to praise and worship God even in tongues to a place where we're speaking mysteries? to God in our praise and worship. Talk about taking it to the next level. Well, we understand some things about God. Let's praise him for those things we understand. What if we praise him for the things we can't possibly understand? Mysteries. That's what tongues allows us to do. It gives us the ability to do that. And I will get into all the gifts of the Spirit starting next week, but this evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important for us to understand, guys. It's so important for us to understand. In a way, praying in tongues is the ultimate act of humility in your prayer life. Why do I say that? Because you literally are saying, by praying in tongues, you're saying, God, I don't know the best way to pray. I can't figure this out on my own. I'm going to let your spirit take over and allow my spirit to hear you and pray your perfect will over any situation. Maybe even over situations you know nothing about. What if you were praying in, in the Spirit about a situation that was coming up that you didn't even know was going to happen and God solved it before it ever happened? I mean, that's a tool that the church could really use, right? But all too often, we just put it on the shelf and we say, ah, it's kind of weird, so I'm not going to do it. Weird? I think you're weird if you put it on the shelf. Maybe not so smart. Church, that's one powerful gift if you think about it. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says this, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. We do not know how to pray as we should. I am an awesome prayer. I know exactly what to say. I know perfectly well what to say to get God to do what I want him to do for me. Scripture says, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit, the hagios pneuma, the awe-inspiring Spirit of the living God himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. What a tool. What a gift. What an opportunity. And understand, it doesn't have to be a spooky thing whatsoever. The Holy Spirit is always a perfect gentleman. He will never force himself on you and make you lose all sense of control. The Word of God declares that the Holy Spirit, as he is moving in, on, or through an individual, is subject to that individual. It says the Spirit is subject to the prophet. He means, and that means he won't make you do something that you just don't want to do. He won't. But you should want to do some of those things. To enter into this, this being used in the gift, to, to be baptized in this Holy Spirit, to be being filled to the place where you are displaying the evidence of that baptism, which is speaking in an unknown tongue, praying, extolling God, praising, worshiping, praying, all those things. If you've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but have seemed to just not get it or understand why it, is, it, it isn't happening for you, j just, I, I'm gonna tell you that this morning, let go and let God Quit trying to figure it out. Just calm yourself down. Put all those crazy thoughts about not being worthy aside. Jesus made you worthy today. He shed his blood for you. Okay? Put those thoughts and lies from the enemy aside. Relax and just let the, over, the Holy Spirit overwhelm you. He, he, and he will. He will. Just shut this off and soak in the Spirit of God. Amen. It's not a hard thing. It's not a you get it, you don't, you get it, you don't. No, it's for everybody. Just like salvation. It's for everybody. 
And for those that, that have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, don't grow weary in the practice of it. Good grief, why would we put that on the shelf, especially during these days when we have no idea what's going to happen? You know what the hardest thing to do uh, this last year as a pastor has been? We haven't really been able to have calendars. We can make a church calendar that went way out last year or the year before COVID. We could put a calendar out there and we kind of could plan. You can't plan for anything. And, and some of you can, can, can understand that because you're the same way. You can't plan anything. can't plan a wedding because you don't know what the rules are going to be two months from now. You can't plan nothing. So it's just like, okay, we'll just kind of, if, if it works, we'll just, wow, we'll just do it. It's difficult, difficult in a church to do that. We live in times where we absolutely need this. I love what, what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank God, this is the Apostle Paul, he wrote over half the New Testament, he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Oh, but that was for then and that's not for today. Doesn't say that in scripture. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. If the Apostle Paul felt it was important enough to practice it regularly, always praying in tongues, why don't we? Why don't we? As confusing as the world is right now, conflicting messages from leaders, mandates that seem more about power grabbing than protecting, common sense being thrown out the window, deceptions and lies just flowing like rivers, people getting lackadaisical with their faith and their personal relationships with Christ, and I could go on and on and on, but it, isn't it time that the people of the Spirit, those that have accepted Christ and actively are seeking His Holy Spirit, isn't it time for them to rise up and pray like our futures depend on it? Amen. Because they do. If people of the Spirit stop praying in the Spirit, things are going to continue to get worse. If people of the Spirit start praying in the Spirit, things will continue to get worse, but we will experience the move of God and the outpouring of God in the midst of everything that's getting worse in the world. I mean, we know that things are going to get worse. Why are we talking about that? Oh, well, it's just getting worse. It's getting pretty bad out there. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. Scripture told us that was going to happen. It's getting pretty bad out there. When things get bad out there, thou shallest complain about it. <laughs> right? No. Rise up, O oh men and women of God, people of the Spirit, people of the presence of God. Use the gifts that God has given you, the spiritual manifestation gifts, the first one that we're talking about today somewhat, and we'll get into it more next week, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay, when that happens, it, it kind of wakes us up to the gifts even more than we were, and so then we have the, the, the speaking in tongues as, as a gift of the Spirit, a tool that he hands us and says, use this because it will greatly enhance your ability to get through all this stuff. And it will help you be effective. It's power for witnessing, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. And Jesus is coming back, church. Let's use the time we have left wisely and effectively to reach as many as we can for his kingdom. And if our great tool of power to do this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is left out of our arsenal, how can we ever say that we did all we could? Well, I tried to do my best, but God said, well, I gave you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You knew all about it. I gave you the gift of tongues so you could pray the perfect prayer. Yeah, but it's kind of weird. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a man. And I don't want to do something weird. That, that emotional stuff's for the women. Why am I saying this? Because I've heard these things before. It's a tool that he's given you to be powerful in all that he's called you to do. Why would you put that on the shelf? I'm having one of those, hello, George McFly, George McFly <laughs> moments. Anybody there? Anybody home?
Don't leave this out of your arsenal. If you're at home this morning, watching online, watching your phone, we're so thankful that you joined us today. And I'm going to tell you, just find a place. I said this last week, I'll say it again. Find a place that's quiet. Turn on a little worship music maybe after, after this or take a break, eat lunch, and then come back to this some afternoon or sometime this afternoon. And just ask God to fill you with this Holy Spirit. And even ask him to give you that evidence that you've been filled, the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. We saw it in Scripture. All you, do is have, all you have to do is ask. So I challenge you to even do that at home. If you, if you feel like you need to call the church this week and we can talk you through it a little bit, we're glad to do that as well. But we're so thankful that, that you watched today and that you've been a part of this. We're going to pray in this church for this again this morning. Pastor Jared can help me and some of the elders if they want to come down front. If they're able to, please come down and, and join us in prayer. We want to pray for people to receive this gift because it's crazy to leave it on the shelf. Some of you may need a, a, a refilling. Some of you may need a, 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 a first-time filling. That's okay. We're going to pray either way. But I'm going to close in prayer as we say goodbye this morning to our online streaming audience and then we're going to uh, get down to business in here and do some praying that sound good lord god i thank you today for this service i thank you for these people that are here you knew exactly who was supposed to be here you knew exactly who was supposed to be online lord i pray that you would just pour out your spirit in a mighty way baptize submerse emerge immerse your people in the spirit in your holy spirit god even with the evidence of speaking in tongues god let us use this tool like never before especially as we live in these days make us powerful and effective in our witness lord because of it and god we give you all the glory and honor and praise in jesus name amen Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.